I don't know how much you want to know about me. My name is Vineet Bafna. live and work in San Diego, and you're all welcome to come and visit sometime. So I want to talk about selection a little bit. Okay? And um, I don't know if you've heard of this city. It's called Cerro de Pasco. It's in Peru. It's uh, where we did some of our work. And it's always in the news for all the wrong reasons. You know, it's a, there's a silver mine there where people come and work. And so there's a lot of pollution. And if I show you this picture, I think it kind of makes it obvious how, how much the mine sort of dominates the landscape of the town, right? So, so when people work at such high altitudes, you know, they of course suffer from, uh, from a hypoxic stress. Uh, and if you and I were to go to, uh, to a mountain, we often get acute mountain sickness uh, characterized by headaches, fatigues, things like that. And then in a few days of being there, you get acclimatized and you recover. And the way your body recovers is simply that it makes, uh, most, in most cases, it makes more red blood cells and that allows it to carry more oxygen that works for you. But this, while this is a good short-term strategy, it's a really poor long-term strategy because if you were to stay in this state for, a long, for many years, your blood is more viscous and you would be a lot more prone to cardiovascular problems. And that's what's afflicting many of the people, but not all. And they suffer from this disease called chronic mountain sickness, which really has a strong sort of uh, negative impact on their life, on their quality of life, and also their lifespan. Right? So, what was interesting to us when we first started studying these populations many years ago is that not everybody uh, uh, responds in the same way. Some people seem to be well acclimatized, and it seems to be a genetic effect. And and we are not the only ones who study highlander populations. There are other sort of populations uh, uh, across the world uh, where, where people have been living, uh, and you, you might even say thriving at very high altitudes uh, with very, very low oxygen levels. So in the Himalayas and, and in the Andean mountains, the oxygen levels are at 60% of normal oxygen levels. And, and for, uh, for somebody who's not adapted, it would be very, very difficult to live a normal lifestyle. All right, so, so the question really is, uh, you know, what makes these people adapt? And it's, it's a kind of genetic selection, but it's very different from the polygenic selection that John talked about yesterday because the, the selection pressure is more acute. There wasn't as much time. People only had a limited amount of time to, to actually adapt. And so a few alleles with very large effect probably dominated the adaptation. And, and it's our goal to try and find what those mutations are. Okay. And also because uh, Eliezer uh, told me that this was going to be a disease-focused thing, I should at least put one slide saying that oxygen homeostasis is a big part of, of many, many diseases, cardiovascular, cancer, name it. They're all of these diseases. There are uh, there's a lot of tissue injury due to hypoxia in the local region. So certainly understanding something about the genes involved in these pathways is also relevant from a disease perspective. All right, so in a nutshell, this is my talk, that you have individuals uh, from these uh, different populations, some that have, survived, that have adapted very well. We call them non-CMS for non-chronic mountain sickness and individuals that have not. And we sort of want to figure out which are the mutations that, that confer this long-term adaptation. So in the spirit of how, how the talks have been, I'm going to go slowly and talk a little bit about uh, some of the basic tools that we use, and with apologies to all the experts in the audience. And I, I should also take this opportunity to really thank the CGSI organizers for arranging this wonderful sort of workshop where we get, uh, you know, even uh, for uh, someone like me, there's so many areas that I don't know about. It's actually good to learn some of the tools that people use in other fields and, and how they, and they work. So, so let's talk about uh, genetic variation. If you sort of line up all the individuals, I don't think this audience needs to know this, but still, if you line up all the genomes, it's easy to line them up because we are mostly identical. And then you can look at some of the variable positions. I'm just looking at mutations right now, but you could do it with other kinds of mutations too. I mean, I'm just looking at substitutions, but you can have other mutations too. And if you want to sort of reduce the amount of uh, things you want to look at, you can remove all the columns that are identical, call one of the alleles zero and the other one, and you get a binary matrix. Okay? And so we often, we will often work with this binary matrix. And 
If you look at individuals, uh, there is also a hidden genealogy, of course, because evolution connects us all. And you can sort of uh, imagine there was a common ancestor back in time, which, uh, where the sequences eventually diverged and led to the current population that we see out here, or the sample that we are seeing here. Mutations are falling on these branches, and we often make the infinite sites assumption so that you know, if a mutation falls here, everybody who descended from this will carry a one in this, uh, in this position, and you can see that's happening here. All right. So, so uh, even though this genealogy is hidden from us, it's always something good to keep in mind, uh, uh, and it, we'll use this as a mnemonic for many of the things that we do. So uh, imagine that you're looking at specific windows, and you sample the data, and you get your SNP matrix. Right? What you can do is you can um, also look at the distribution of frequencies of alleles. And that's a very powerful tool in this field. So very simply, you just take your first position, and you can see that there are only two individuals that carry the mutation in the first position. So you put a two out here. And in the second case, you put it a one uh, for the diamond out here. This one appears in three individuals, so it's three and so on. So you, so you get all of these frequencies, and you can make a histogram of these frequencies. So uh, in this case, the number of, uh, there are four individuals that have a mutation with frequency one. You can see them out here. And so you put a four in this histogram and so on, right? Now you do one more operation, and then you get what we call a scaled site frequency spectrum. So you just take the number of individuals that have a frequency of one and just multiply it by the frequency. It's four times one gives you four. You have uh, three individuals with, with a frequency of two, and multiplying them you get six. And sort of if you squint a little, it starts looking like a straight horizontal line. And that, in fact, is, is a very nice result. Uh, that when you have uh, alleles evolving neutrally, Fu in 1995 showed that, in fact, the scale uh, site frequency spectrum is a straight line with a value at theta, which is the population scale frequency. It's a very, very nice result. It only uses elementary methods, but it's very clever. So I often give it as homework in my class, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way to get started in this field. Right? So, so this is one of the basic tools that we use. If you take a population, a region of uh, individuals and a population sample, and you compute the scale site frequency spectrum, you should see something like a scale, a straight line. Now let's see what happens in the case of selection. Right? So, so imagine that you have these individuals, and they are connected, of course, by this genealogy, which is hidden to us. But this segment of the population now, let's say, goes up to the high mountain and they are subjected, this onset of selection, this selection pressure. And if there was a mutation around that time, it could happen a little earlier, a little later. If the but if it happens around that time and it helps the people adapt, then what's going to happen? That individuals that carry this mutation are going to expand in frequency, right? So after a period of time, you will see that individuals out here begin to uh, sort of grow, and individuals not carrying these mutations, they begin to shrink. And if you now look at the scale site frequency spectrum, you'll begin to see obvious changes because you see a lot of mutations that are carried by a lot of people, right? So you suddenly see an increase in the high frequency mutations, and you also see a lot of rare mutations, mutations that happen here and are only carried by a few people. And so when you plot it out in this red line, you can see this U-shaped curve, which actually helps you distinguish it from a neutral chain. Okay. It's important to know this not just because, not just to say that there's a signal of selection, but there's a temporal aspect to this selection. So if you go on in time, what's going to happen? Well, at some point, if, this, if the selection pressure stays constant, this mutation that's beneficial is going to fix in the population. Everybody is going to carry that. And around that time is when you have sort of the strongest signal of selection. But if you sort of keep going forward in time, at this point, everybody is equally fit, for, at least for this mutation. And so uh, what's going to happen is that begin, things begin to drift again. There's recombination, and the recombination doesn't do anything bad with respect to this mutation. And over time, these two signals will merge again. So there's a temporal aspect that's not often appreciated 
that you can only capture a selective sweep during a certain stage from the time that the onset of selection happened to a particular time and of course all things being equal at some point the signal will be lost. There will be other kinds of signals but, but the specific allele frequency signals actually are only active during a certain point of time. Okay, And, and it's important to say this because uh, if you had to ask well how are you going to detect selection? You look at the literature, there's just tons of methods. In fact, when we started in this field, we even wondered if there was something left to do in this uh, area, just the number. By the way, our tools right out here somewhere, you know, one of the tools that we made uh, back in 2013. So you can see that there's a huge, huge development. But it's, it's, uh, if you want to try and understand how these selection works, there are actually systematic ways. And one of the simplest things is, that you could take these two curves, the red and blue curve, and compute some kind of a statistic, a weighted sum of these numbers that could separate them, right? So you could imagine that there's a there's sort of a weight vector and you're projecting everything on it in a way that you want to separate the red dots from the blue dots, right? So this is, this is how it is. And it turns out uh, many, many of these uh, methods that were produced actually do nothing better than just creating weight. So if you must have heard of things like Tajima's D, it's a very simple weighting function which you can explicitly write down and as long as you weight like this you'll be able to separate the selected from the non-selected. And then there's phase and Wu's H, another famous spectrum and again you can think of it in terms of these weight functions. You can sort of sum them and you'll get the difference. And because now you know what the weights are, you can also kind of predict that this should do better when there are a lot of low frequency mutations. It doesn't give such high weights to the high frequency ones. Fe and Wu sort of equally weights the low and high frequency, so they shouldn't work equally at all regimes of selection. And you can sort of test this idea, and if you plot sort of, this is the time since the onset of selection, and out here is the power, the fraction of individuals that you could predict selection on at very low selection rates, and you can sort of try and do it for different selection rates, and you can see that in every case you're very good at predicting just around fixation, but then the two methods actually deviate a little bit. One does better at the, in sort of the post-selection regime, one does better at the, at the sort of near fixation regime, okay? And so once you have this kind of an idea, one could imagine that you could do something that dominates all this simply by learning the right set of weights. And, and some years ago we did do this. We just used support vector machines on the scale side frequency spectrum. And, and it was easy to show that you could dominate not these two, but just everything, all the other site frequency spectrum based methods and, and many of the other methods as well. So it gave us a handle on selection. It's not sort of the focus of my talk today, but I thought I would bring this in just to explain how many of these methods of selection work. Okay. And so we, we applied this, of course, to our, our, our data set and we identified about six or seven regions. Uh, this was one of the ones that was interesting. The genes weren't known. And I think you want to notice something interesting about this, that this is a very large region. It's about, uh, about two, uh, maybe uh, about 500 KB or something, or one megabase. I can't read so well. But usually, when you run these tests of selection, you actually isolate a very large region, depending on how strong the selection pressure is and how much time has uh, elapsed. And so after that, there's a lot of guesswork involved in finding what genes are uh, important. And that's sort of the main focus of my talk. But just to uh, give a little bit of the biology, we did identify at that time a gene called SENP1. And, and it, it sort of taught us a little bit about the biology. And I'd sort of this is work done by my collaborators, but I just wanted to bring uh, sort of some closure to the story by saying how these methods work and how they can be applied in practice. So, so the main thing about, uh, about sort of adapting to hypoxia is that you, in the, in the non-adapted case, you do it by increasing the red blood cells. And the way this works is that there's this master transcription factor, HIF, the hypoxia inducible factor, and it's induced in response to hypoxia. And once it is induced, it sort of switches on a lot of genes that are involved in the red blood cell production. And so there you can get an increase in red blood cells. But under normoxia conditions, there is another enzyme that sort of chops up uh, it's a protease that breaks up this, and so the, the factor is not as active as it, uh, it can be. All right, so this is how it works. And, and when the earlier studies were done, there was a study in science uh, in the Tibetan paper, and I think if you were, uh, uh, if you heard 
uh, Huerta Sanchez's talk last time, she, she did mention some of this. This is work done by the BGI people. They found a, uh, another uh, HIF factor, another hypoxia inducible factor. It's also called EPAS1. And rightly, they suspected that some repressing mutations uh, would prevent it from working and so thereby stop erythropoiesis. And they, uh, there's a separate paper also in the Tibetan populations where they found activating mutations in this gene that's supposed to, uh, to sort of break up uh, HIF2 and so it also has the right effect. Okay. And so our result puts this in a slightly different context. We first we validated it uh, recently in a second population and the, the, the SENP1 gene still shows up. And my collaborators did a number of experiments. They also worked in flies where they knocked out the gene, but then they did some um, iPSC-based uh, sort of derived uh, erythropoietic cells and showed uh, that what this SENP1 does is that it's, it has the, uh, it prevents the degradation of HIF1 alpha in the normal case, but in the hypoxia case, if you can, I'm sorry, in the adapted case, if you can stop the action of SENP1 through some repressive mutations, then, then, uh, then HIF1 will not be as active. So, so that's sort of the direction in which we go. We kind of know a lot about this gene, but we still don't know what the mutations are that cause this kind of repression to happen. Okay. So, so that's really, really the problem that, that bothered us for a long time. And, and at the time that we were thinking about this, there was really, you know, we talked to a lot of people and they said that this is really not a problem that can be solved. You're talking about large regions that are under selection. We are talking about something like 10 to 20,000 mutations in some of these regions. They can be as long as 2 million base pairs. And you can do some functional analysis. You can look at what, what you know, mutations are non-synonymous or in regulatory regions. And, but, it, but none of those methods seem to work very, very well. So people said this is, and solving it genetically did not look like a problem that was approachable. So we started at that time with something that we thought would be simpler, which is to say that you have a bunch of individuals. You don't know what the mutation is, but maybe you can identify the haplotypes that carry that mutation, right? So rather than saying, which is the mutation that is conferring the selective advantage, can you try and figure out the individuals that carry that mutation? Okay, so it's, it's getting part of the way there, but not quite. All right, <clears throat> so, so after a lot of thinking, we came up with this idea. And it's a very simple idea in, in we, we, we What we do is we score every haplotype in a very simple way. So look at the haplotype to the right. This is an individual that carries a mutation at positions two, three, nine, and 11, right? So, so that's its haplotype in the zero one sort of representation. What we do is you just replace each of these ones by the size of the frequency of this. So the number of individuals that carry this mutation. And you don't really need the genealogy to do this. So the genealogy is just for expertise, okay? So, so you get a three for the two, a three for this mutation at three, nine gets a two, and then 11 gets a one. And then you just sum up all these numbers and that gives you your half score, okay? So um, if you look at the half score of all these individuals, they look kind of similar. And in expectation, they should have the same number. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about, about it in a minute. But under selection, they begin to behave very differently, right? So you start out out here and let's say that at, at the individual, that's at the very bottom right, there is a mutation that makes it favored in a selective regime. Well, what's gonna happen is that this individual, the descendants of this individual are going to grow with time. And so the frequency of this mutation grows, but you also see a lot of mutations with high frequencies, the so-called hitchhiking mutations. And so when you compute the half scores, you can see that the half scores here become very, very large, where the half scores of the non-carriers become very small. So it's like a, score that differentiates the carrier individuals from the non-carrier individuals. And if you keep going, well, at some point, these mutations become fixed. They're no longer polymorphic. They're no longer part of the calculation and the half score crashes for everything. So there's this dynamics that we have to capture. All right, and so we, we did a lot of simulations and indeed, you can see that there's a nice separation between the carriers and the non-carriers. Uh, and and, and that, that, should be, uh, that should be useful as a clue to finding things, all right? So, so for a while we wondered because the, the, 
the, the, the prediction, I mean, the sort of the behavior was so predictable, we thought we could do a little bit more. And, and you know, we sort of, it's good to take uh, Feynman's uh, remarks, which said that if all of mathematics disappeared, physics would be set back by exactly one week, you know, so not, not very important. And what is true for theoretical physics is certainly true for biology, for sure. But, but we still, uh, we had enough machinery at that time to be able to capture the dynamics correctly. So we did take some time to figure out the math, although it, it wasn't as important to what followed afterwards, right? So, so let's look at the, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, the dynamics again. At the very beginning, when there's no selection, you know, the, the half, there's no carrier and non-carriers are identical, and we can use sort of standard Collison theory to predict, and it's roughly, the half score is simply theta times the number of uh, individuals in the sample divided by two. That's the expected value. There is a variance, and even in the presence of recombination, our estimates are very, very accurate, okay? And now if you look at uh, the time when the haplotype score has, the half score has crashed, when the individuals have fixed in the population, everybody has a low half score. At that time, the population looks like it's exponentially growing, right? Because it's just at the time of fixation. So we can also use some results from before uh, 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 due to Kreitman and others. And again, we get a very nice prediction of the half score, uh, which confirms very well between the theory and the simulation. And then the middle part, which is the most sort of interesting, uh, is where we can get an exact uh, sort of prediction that quantifies the expected half score between the carrier, for the carriers and for the non-carriers, and shows a difference that really increases as the frequency of the selected mutation is growing. Right. And, and there's some nice results which, which sort of, uh, which give the expected values and, and we have some other sort of evidence that this, this works very well. All right, so, so we have the toolkit in hand. What we did with these, with the half scores, we just used some kind of a Gaussian clustering and we could actually, you know, on all the well-known sweeps, we could figure out that the top cluster is indeed always the carrier. So here the carriers are shown in red and the non-carriers are shown in blue. You can see there's a lot more variation in non-carriers, but the carriers seem to have a consistent half score. Sometimes there's, because of uh, standing variation or other sort of uh, soft sweep scenarios, it's uh, the clustering, uh, the clustering still works, but the half scores are a little bit more diverse. But in every case that we tried, uh, we could nicely separate out the carriers from the non-carriers. And indeed for our, our case of SENP1, we could see that in the non-CMS, which is the selected individuals, people don't have, who do not have chronic mountain sickness, all the haplotypes seem to have a consistent and high HAP score. Whereas in the case of the non-adapted or partially adapted individuals, that was not the case. There were many uh, haplotypes with, with, with a low HAP score. So, so things look good, but we were not quite uh, uh, there yet. And so, we did finally feel like we had the machinery to find actually the, the alleles favored in evolution it's themselves. And so uh, Ali Akbari, who's my, who was my student then, he's now doing a postdoc with David Reich. He came up with this very, very nice idea. He said, let's take a mutation and, and look at all of the individuals that carry that mutation and look at their half scores. If this mutation is on the favored lineage, all of them should have a high half score. So what we do is we measure the, free, the fraction of half scores that are, uh, of the total half score that is carried by all of the descendants, all of the individuals carrying that mutation, we call it phi. Okay. And then we also take the number of distinct haplotypes, so the number of distinct half scores, and the fraction of those that are carried by the people carrying this, the individuals carrying that mutation. And so both of these are scores for a mutation. And then he came up with, uh, with a score which just looks like a normalization, you know, a different statistic of these two. The reason it works is very simple. So first, under neutrality, you expect it to be zero because as you sort of increase in frequency, as you have more individuals carrying that mutation, they, they, they will cover an increasing part of the half score and they will, sorry, it's uh, flipped, and they will also carry an increasing part of the number of distinct haplotypes. And so you can see that this looks almost normally distributed, and, and it, 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 the, the two numbers behave very quick, nicely. 
but under case of selection, they actually diverge in opposite direction. Sorry, this uh, is just flipped. Uh, in this case, these individuals have very few distinct haplotypes. There's a lot more variation in the number of distinct half scores, but all of them are high half scores. So the phi value is increasing, and the kappa value is decreasing, and the difference statistic is increasing. All right. So another way to sort of think about it is, is to look at the phylogeny, and you get these sort of two clusters. Okay, so these are individuals which have a lot of diversity here, but not as many, uh, not as high of a a fraction of the fee score and these correspond to the individuals that are not under the selective regime that really come from the out group so as to speak. The individuals here are individuals that have a very high fee score but also have a high k value and they are really the ancestral mutations. The mutations that sort of get a high frequency because they are hitchhiking with the favored mutation. And then if you look at individuals here they turn out to have low k and uh, sort of high phi. And so there's a little bit of a kink. And where you see the kink in the curve is where this statistic is maximized. And that's the favored mutation. All right, so, so that's sort of the intuition. It's, it's kind of incomplete. We don't have a full theory about it. But it works really well in practice on short windows. Okay, And so, so, uh, so we, we still needed to in, increase it to, to uh, I, I wanted to show you results. But in the interest of time, I think I'm just going to, uh, to skip the results on SAFE and just go directly to the main method, which extends this to a large window. So, so while this works in short regions where there's low recombination regions of maybe 50,000 base pairs, we are really oftentimes working with very, very large windows, things almost as big as 5 million base pairs with many thousands of SNPs. And, and we need to do something more to get it to work over there. And so here he came up with one other idea, which is a very nice idea, which is simply that if you take any of these uh, windows, there will be a mutation that dominates. If you apply the half score, you will get something that's higher. But what if you take the favored mutation in every window and plug it into another window? It will only do well if it is the true favored mutation, because it kind of clearly separates out the phenotype. So in this case, this is the true favored mutation. It's separating the carriers from the non-carriers. If you were to bring it and plug it in here, it's going to do a good job of, of uh, sort of separating out all of these carriers from all of these non-carriers. But if you were to take this mutation and plug it in here, it's not going to do such a good job. Okay, so, so we get a score of applying, a half, uh, sort of a safe score of applying a particular mutation in a particular window. And uh, once we see that there's a mutation that seems to work well in all windows, and we, there's a window that seems to work well with a large number of mutations, we can combine those two ideas and, and come up with an iSafe score, which I will, in the interest of time, I won't go too much into the detail. All right, so, so that's roughly how this, this, this score works. And uh, in, when we started comparing, there weren't actually a lot of tools. There was a paper due to uh, Pardis Sabeti uh, it was published in Science. It's called the Composite of Multiple Signals, or CMS. And it was, it was the only signal. It just sort of combined a whole variety of signals. And wherever it was, wherever the signal was maximized, was considered to be the localization for the mutation. The problem with that is that in order to do all the neutral calculations, you had to incorporate a large number of other tools. And it was just difficult to make it work. So we actually worked with the Sabeti lab to make sure our comparisons were accurate. But that was the only other tool. We also looked at other tools which, which really are detecting regions under selection but score every mutation. And they, we just take the mutation that has the highest score and, and, and work with that. All right, so and, and we work with the, we worked with many different kinds of models. But one of the ones that we worked with was a standard model of human demography, which has the bottleneck at, out of Africa and then other bottlenecks that sort of give the uh, East Asian and European lineages. And so this is a pictorial view of how it works. So in this uh, picture, you can see out here, these are the half scores. And you can see there's a very nice clear plot with a, with a single mutation on top. And this is the one with the highest half score and is also the correct mutation. In contrast, CMS gives the score of 216, the true favored mutation. And while you can see that it is localizing the region, it's not doing as well. And then we also mentioned the frequencies. 
and you can see uh, that for a whole range of frequencies, uh, if you just look at the blue scores, they are uniformly good. Right? So in aggregate, we can also look at it another way, which is to look at the cumulative, and if you look at the top 20 SNPs, 94% of the time, uh, our results uh, give an answer that which ranked the top mutation, the correct mutation in the top 20, whereas in comparison to only maybe 25% of the time that CMS did it. Okay, so, so there's a huge difference between what, what was uh, known before and what we can achieve with these. And if you look at it uh, on the on sort of well-characterized sweeps, and you look at uh, mutations with very different frequencies, which should behave very differently. Again, you can see that the results are very consistent and very strong. In most cases, it's among the top ranked, and, and, you know, and it's almost always in the top 20. And we did this analysis. There, were, there are 25 or so uh, mutations, but you know, I should say these are not sweeps where the mutation is fully known, but generally suspected to be correct. Uh, in 17 out of 25, uh, we had sort of high confidence ranks. These are the ones out here, and these are the ranks of the mutation. You can see that in most of the cases, our rank was less than or equal to three for the right mutation. We're talking about a single mutation out of 20,000 candidates or so. So it's a very strong result. And there were a few odd cases where we believed what we had, but we didn't get a good rank on it. And I will say that in many of these cases, we believe that uh, our tool is offering a better explanation. I just give you one sort of example of, of one of these tools. So this is the tyrosinase, it's a pigmentation locus. And there were two candidates known for this. And the one that iSafe predicted was different from both of them. Uh, and both of these um, mutations, uh, we also found were actually highly ranked. And in, under, in specific populations, they do show up as being strong. But the reason this mutation was not picked is because it's very close to fixation. And unless you look at a lot of different populations, maybe this mutation never even came in the sort of mindset of people. But when we apply iSafe to different populations, to European population from the Americas, the East Asian, in every case it picks it up as the single, as the top ranking mutation by a large margin. And, and if you look at sort of populations, you can see that there are two clear haplotypes in, in most populations with very long haplotype stretches indicative of selection. And this mutation sort of right in the middle for both of these haplotypes. So there are many, uh, in the paper, there are many other uh, results which, which sort of clarify why we believe that this is the right mutation. All right, so uh, uh, what about uh, the SENP1 gene? Well, we do have a candidate, not fully tested, but it happens to lie right in a DNA's hypersensitive region just near the core promoter of SENP1. So, so we believe we have something interesting out there, but not, not yet validated. Okay, so in conclusion, I think uh, it's an interesting result. It's a, you know, popular, it's selection is a very sort of specialized field. There are not that many uh, uh, known sort of strong sweeps uh, in the human populations, but there are certainly in many model organism populations, and our results say that with the judicious use of, of PopGen, we can actually do a good job of identifying these mutations. Okay, all right, I want to thank uh, Ali and uh, uh, Roy for who did most of the work that I talked about today. And then there had many great collaborators, Siavash you just heard from uh, previously, also Glenn Tesler in Matt and Noah Rosenberg at Stanford. And then the iSafe work, we also collaborated with the Sabeti lab. And then our experimental collaborators, uh, Gabby Haddad's lab, they did a lot of the experiments both in human fibroblast and also in the flies. Right. Okay, and I'll stop here, thank you.